Buon pomeriggio a tutti quanti, siete numerosissimi e in attesa ci scusiamo per il ritardo, ma eh, quello che ho capito oggi accompagnando Lee McBowie eh, al Centro Diritti Umani qui in Università è che eh, quando sei un premio Nobel, soprattutto un premio Nobel per la pace, eh, è come se tutto il mondo avesse diritto a un pezzo di Lee McBowie e lei è molto generosa e quindi... Uh, siamo in ritardo, ma grazie per aver aspettato. Uh, io chiamo il magnifico Rettore uh, per un saluto uh, come inizio di questo incontro. Professor Rosario Rizzuto. Autorità, colleghe e colleghe, studentesse e studenti, cittadini, vedo che in questo caso tutta la città accolga con grande eh, onore e piacere eh, Lima Guboe. Abbiamo un premio Nobel, abbiamo un premio Nobel, devo dire che è una tradizione che a noi piace, noi abbiamo portato premi Nobel a parlare in eh, quest'aula e ascoltare parlare di, di scienza, di vari aspetti della scienza. Oggi però è un giorno speciale, perché abbiamo un premio Nobel speciale, abbiamo un premio Nobel per la pace. E permettetemi di dire che per l'università, questo, e sapete quanto appassionato sono io di scienza, questo è ancora più pregnante, ancora più emozionante che avere un premio Nobel che parla di scienza. Abbiamo oggi un premio Nobel che ha vissuto la guerra, noi siamo in un momento preoccupante della nostra storia perché veniamo da un lunghissimo periodo di pace, quindi non siamo abituati all'idea della, della guerra. Eppure la guerra ci rimbalza addosso continuamente, la vediamo, la leggiamo, ne cogliamo le conseguenze, pensiamo alla drammatica fuga di, di chi dalla, dalla guerra prova a fuggire. E quindi la guerra è un, una situazione che, che viviamo e, e allora ritorniamo alla nostra storia e ritorniamo alla storia di quando abbiamo vissuto la guerra, di quando abbiamo vissuto la guerra e ne siamo usciti con coraggio, ne, abbiamo, ne siamo usciti cercando la pace ma ricordandoci che non c'è pace senza libertà e senza diritti. E ci ricordiamo e ricordiamo con orgoglio che questo concetto, questa università, l'Università della Patavina Libertas, l'ha difeso, l'ha difeso con coraggio, l'ha difeso con sacrificio e ho ricordato al premio Nobel che si deve sentire a casa in questa università e si deve sentire a casa perché questa università ha due caratteristiche che, di cui a due punti gloriosi della sua storia di cui, a cui lei si, si sente sicuramente vicina, aver laureato la prima donna e avere difeso la libertà diventando l'unica università italiana medaglia d'oro al valor militare. Per tutti questi motivi la storia che ascolteremo, che ascolterete, la storia coraggiosissima di una donna in un paese di guerra che ha voluto difendere la libertà, difendere la libertà ricordando che la libertà è nei diritti. E quindi bisognava, discutevamo prima, fare terminare le guerre, ma fare terminare le guerre non con altre guerre, ma fare terminare le guerre col concetto di pace. E fare terminare la guerra ricordando che alcuni diritti inviolabili sono una base fondamentale della pace, tra questi i diritti delle donne. Quindi avere difeso i diritti delle donne in un momento di guerra e avere portato e contribuito al, alla fine della guerra riemerge, facendo riemergere alcuni concetti fondamentali sono stati quello che l'ha portata al premio Nobel e quello che ce, ce la fa sentire molto cara ci fa realmente dare un caloroso benvenuto in quest'aula al premio Nobel Lee McBowie e a tutti voi che l'ascolterete.
È davvero un grandissimo onore avere qui eh, la premio Nobel Lima Poe eh, in Aula Magna oggi. È un'occasione straordinaria, io credo, di condivisione di una parte di storia e di un'esperienza del nostro tempo che parla di impegno, di visione, di militanza, di grande tenacia e di successo, tutti declinati al femminile. Questa è la prima eh, Padua Nobel Lecture di Universa, il palinsesto di attività culturali e comunicazione dei saperi dell'Ateneo, che prevede che in prossimità eh, dell'inizio dell'anno accademico un premio Nobel venga a condividere con noi la sua esperienza. Noi siamo felicissimi che a inaugurare questa rassegna eh, di Nobel Lecture sia una donna e che i temi che affronteremo siano i diritti delle persone, delle donne, delle bambi dei bambini, delle bambine, delle nazioni e anche eh, il tema della pace come il primo e forse il più problematico dei diritti. Eh, non avremmo potuto avere qui l'IMAC Bowe senza una collaborazione fondamentale eh, perché eh, portare queste persone eh, in Italia non è sempre così facile e eh, la nostra collaborazione è con la Fondazione Umberto Veronesi e la sua iniziativa milanese di Science for Peace che si tiene domani e quindi Lee McBowe ha accettato di venire a Padova, on the way to Milan. Noi siamo molto grati, vorrei chiedere a Telmo Pievani di venire a dire due parole perché ehm, appunto eh, ricorre anche eh, un anno dalla morte di Umberto Veronesi. Buongiorno anche da parte mia e come diceva adesso la prolettrice questa Nobel Lecture è organizzata in collaborazione con la Fondazione Umberto Veronesi, è una charity internazionale con la quale la nostra università peraltro collabora già da diversi anni perché molti nostri ricercatori padovani hanno vinto eh, bandi eh, finanziamenti della Fondazione per le loro ricerche in campo medico eh, e biologico. Um, come si diceva domani eh, ci sarà la nuova edizione di Science for Peace la Fondazione Veronesi organizza ogni anno questo grande convegno internazionale che è diventato un network di ricercatori, di scienziati da tutto il mondo che collaborano tra di loro per favorire processi eh, di pace. E ci piacerebbe poi, eh, lo dico, eh, continuare anche nei prossimi anni questa collaborazione con la Fondazione eh, a Milano. È un evento che è stato fortemente voluto da Umberto Veronesi e ci piaceva, come Ateneo eh, Patavino, creare questa collaborazione proprio a un anno dalla scomparsa di un grande medico e di un grande ricercatore che ha dedicato tutta la vita eh, a modo suo ai diritti delle donne e a favorire l'utilizzo esclusivamente pacifico dei risultati della ricerca scientifica e tecnologica. Grazie e adesso di nuovo ad Annalisa per la presentazione. Io vorrei presentarvi brevemente Lima Powe eh, prima di darle la parola. Um, Poi è un'attivista liberiana, uh, organizzatrice di un movimento pacifista che condusse alla fine della guerra civile in Liberia nel 2003. Ha ottenuto il premio Nobel nel 2011 assieme ad altre due donne, la giornalista yemenita Tawakol Karman, che ha ricevuto minacce di arresto e omicidio per il suo coinvolgimento nelle manifestazioni contro il regime dello Yemen, e nel 2005 ha fondato il gruppo Women Journalists Without Chains. La terza a uh, condividere il Nobel con Lima è un'altra liberiana, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, politica, economista, imprenditrice e presidente uscente della Liberia. È la prima donna eletta democraticamente in Africa come capo di Stato nel 2005. Sappiamo che adesso ci sono, c'è un processo un po' tribol tribolato di eh, nuove elezioni. Eh, Lima Gpaui ha ricevuto assieme a queste donne il premio per la pace con la seguente motivazione. Per la loro battaglia non violenta a favore della sicurezza delle donne e del loro diritto alla piena partecipazione nell'opera di costruzione della pace. Lima così è entrata a far parte di una comunità globale di donne che hanno lavorato per i diritti e la pace, come per esempio Madre Teresa di Calcutta, la birmana Aung San Suu Kyi, eh, la pacifista guatemalteca Rigoberta Menciù, l'iraniana Shirin Ebadi, la keniana Wangari Matai, che è stata la prima donna africana a ricevere il Nobel per la pace proprio 
grazie al suo impegno per lo sviluppo sostenibile e ovviamente la giovanissima pakistana Malala Yousafzai. La storia di Lee McBowie è una storia di attivismo visionario che viene dal basso, costruita nel contesto di una guerra sanguinosissima in Liberia che l'ha portata a farsi domande e a rimboccarsi le maniche per costruire la pace assieme a un movimento di donne vestite di bianco, la Women of Liberia Mass Action for Peace, che ha unito donne cristiane e musulmane in azioni non violente di protesta e richiesta di pace che hanno rivestito un ruolo fondamentale nel porre fine al conflitto nel 2003. Lima aveva 17 anni all'inizio della guerra civile e per 12 anni ha assistito agli orrori del conflitto e alla distruzione delle comunità locali. Nel 98 ha cominciato a lavorare con ex bambini soldato, giovani uomini e donne che si erano uniti alle diverse fazioni in guerra fin da piccoli. Nel suo libro, un testo autobiografico che si intitola Mighty Be Our Powers, How Sisterhood, Prayer and Sex Changed a Nation at War, e anche nel documentario Pray the Devil Back to Hell, eh, di cui vedremo un breve video fra poco, lei stessa racconta di aver sviluppato una rabbia profondissima nei confronti dei promotori della guerra civile e di aver cominciato a chiedersi come avrebbe potuto mettere fine alla carneficina. Nel 2000 il conflitto riprende, molti giovani vengono rapiti, donne stuprate, eh, vittime di abusi eh, inenarrabili. La consapevolezza che il ciclo di violenza andava interrotto e che soltanto le donne avrebbero potuto cambiare le cose in un mondo di violenza maschile divenne fortissima. E fu in quel momento che fece un sogno, in cui, un sogno in cui le veniva chiesto di radunare le donne per pregare a favore della pace. E questo è stato l'inizio di un lungo processo attivo per mettere fine alla guerra e iniziare un lavoro di ampio respiro per il suo paese e per l'Africa. Questo sogno per me unisce idealmente la missione, direi quasi il mandato di Lima come portatrice di pace, al sogno di Martin Luther King, I have a dream, al movimento di Gandhi, alle lotte di Nelson Mandela, alla visione del Dalai Lama, alla presa di posizione di Rosa Parks nel sud degli Stati Uniti per i diritti civili nel 1955. Cowboy, Cowboy ha ricevuto molti riconoscimenti per il suo lavoro tenace, illuminato, fra cui eh, il Lifetime Africa Achievement Prize nel 2016 per la pace in Africa. È presidente della Bowie Peace Foundation Africa, la cui missione è promuovere pace e riconciliazione attraverso il coinvolgimento delle comunità locali. Attualmente lavora a New York, a uh, Columbia University, e fa parte del gruppo di advo advocacy per lo sviluppo sostenibile delle Nazioni Unite ed è madre, ho scoperto adesso, di otto figli. Vorrei concludere con le sue parole leggendo un brevissimo passo dall'autobiografia in cui descrive con chiarezza che cosa significa per lei essere una costruttrice di pace, una peace builder. Lima dice, When I use that word, peace builder, I mean something much more complicated than negotiating, brokering or signing treaties. Peace building to me isn't ending a fight by standing between two opposing forces. It's healing those victimized by war, making them strong again and bringing them back to the people they once were. It's helping victimizers rediscover their humanity so they can once again become productive members of their communities. Peace building is teaching people that resolving conflict can be done without picking up a gun. It's repairing societies in which the guns have been used and not only making them whole, but better. I didn't choose this role. I fell into it. E per renderci conto in che cosa è andata a finire Lima, vi invito a guardare un brevissimo video che è il trailer di un documentario sulla sua azione di pace. E poi le diamo la parola. Grazie. Money, greed, ethnicity, absolute power. There is nothing that should make people do what they did to the children of Liberia. 
The warlords who gave these boys guns and sent them off. They just do anything because they had guns. You go to bed saying, God, please. What do we do? I had a dream. And it was like a crazy dream. We decided to protest. We wore the white, saying to people we were out for peace. Thousands of women, Muslim and Christian, were coming together, calling for peace. These women had seen the worst, but they still had that vibrance for life. And we said, well, if I should get killed, just remember me that I was fighting for peace. We stepped out first and did the unimaginable. To send out a signal to the world that we, the Liberian women, we are tired of the killing of our people. We can do it again if we want to. Here now, gratefully acknowledge the powerful voice of women. Let me now invite uh, Nobel Prize Lee McBowie to come over and deliver a lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Annalisa, for that very generous introduction of me. Um, I know that when you said I had ch eight children, people were like, hmm. That's what keeps me young. Um, my kids, all eight of them, know that I'm the boss. Um, I have a sign in my house. If the queen is happy, there is peace in the kingdom. And that's how we roll. It is truly an honor for me to be here at this university. Um, I'm happy to have set the record of the first woman Nobel laureate, following in the first step of the first woman who graduated from this university as being the first graduate female from any university in the world. This afternoon, I would love to talk to you briefly a mixture of my personal journey and my work to empowering women around issues of peace and security in the world. So my story is that I grew up in a family of five girls. My mother had five daughters and no sons. We have a grandmother who I believe is the one who taught us the basics of feminism. She's very fierce. She's 109 years old and she's still alive. She's the person who would challenge us when we were growing up to be economically strong. At ages eight, nine, 10, I remember her coming and giving us some money and it was intended for us to invest. But she would never tell you that. So at the end of the year, she would come back to you and ask you, how much did you make on the one dollar that I gave you? I always like to enjoy, so I used to be the one who always never ever had any money to show. Because once I got my first coin, I would go grab my friends, and it was either candy or something I became the party girl for the day. We grew up in a neighborhood that we were socialized to believe in the power of collectivity, the human, common humanity. We were from different ethnic groups, but whilst we lived in that compound, in that community, we never really understood when one family did not have food to eat. 
Because children in every home would eat from every home. When your parents travel, every other person in the community was responsible for you and you were accountable to every adult. That was my socialization. So I was socialized from a child to believe that I am part of a whole, a global, I, I, I was socialized to be a part of a global world, to be a global citizen. And then at the age of 17, the Civil War came. And when the war came, it became like my socialization of being a part of the common community or a, a, a part of one world was clashing with the politics of division. You cannot interact with this ethnic group. You cannot interact with that ethnic group. But this is not what I was taught. From my early days, I was taught that we were all one people. And for, for a long time, I carried a sense of anger. I could not understand why my world was turned upside down. If you've gone through war, if you've lived in war, if you came from a place of being in a community and you live in war where all of a sudden this ethnic group cannot interact with that ethnic group, you realize that you have problems. So I kept thinking about it and I know the first time I realized that I had to do something, I went to the north to do a piece of work. And there were refugees from the other country, Sierra Leone. I went to sit with some of the women, and some of them had their breasts cut off by soldiers. Some had been raped repeatedly. But then whilst these women were in that situation in a camp, those who had gone supposedly to help some humanitarian workers there to distribute food were using their power to abuse and exploit these women. So in order for you to get food, you have to give sex. I came back very confused. First, I'm confused about my community that has been divided. And now I'm confused about people who are quote unquote helpers, now using their power as helpers to destroy people. And it disturbed me for a long time I remember when we decided to start doing peace work with the women, we went to a refugee camp. And one after the other, these women told their stories. One after the other, I felt like the breath in me was being sucked out. We sat there and listened, we cried. No one had given us the mandate to go and do it. But this was the beginning of us just wanting, a few friends and myself wanting to do something. The last person who told her story was probably the turning point in my life. She told the story and as she started telling her story, her village was attacked, her husband was killed. She had no clue on where her children had gone. On her way, she, something went into her eyes, her eyes was never treated, she lost her sight. Second wave of fighting, they're trying to get her out of the place because she's blind and she hurt her leg. So at the point where we met this woman, she had multiple traumas, but she was in a little hut. And the person who was supposed to help build her house and gave her food, had refused to put her name on the list because she had refused to give him sex. So I took down her name, grabbed three women, and we went marching to this aid organization. And it was like the first time that I really knew that I had power. Because here we were, a group of women poorly dressed, sitting out in a very plush office, of a big humanitarian organization and seeing the boss of this organization sweat, my confidence level started going up and up and up. And eventually, we were able to not just get this woman her food 
and her shelter built, but we were able to get them to link with us and give them a list of women who had been subjected to the same things and were not getting the kind of support they needed to get to. Imagine you, one day you are feeling not very powerful, and another day you walk and you're feeling very powerful. We decided, how can we take this, what we've done, to another level? And that was the beginning of our persistent engagement in peace-building processes. Most times, especially I'm standing at an academic institution, when people talk about peace, it's primarily centered around ending wars and making society safe for people to live. But I think of it's more important now, today, more than ever before, for us to begin to redefine our idea of peace. A few months ago, I was at the Naval Academy in the US, sitting in front of all military officials and asking them, do you really think that war is about guns and artilleries and bombs? And they were looking at me. Today, we find that a lot of the issues that we have to deal with is not necessarily about militarism. It is about people's inability to be able to live like humans. Let's look at something that all of Europe is struggling with, the refugee crisis. Let's look at the migrant crisis. Let's look at the number and the level of people who move from place to place. Is it just about war? Are we just seeing people come from places where they're fighting war? The answer is a resounding no. But these people are contending that we don't live in peace. And you cannot be in peace if you do not have food to eat, if you do not have shelter, if the conditions for you to live like a human has not been set by those responsible for your well-being. And then I'm sure the response from Europe will be, but it is not fair that it is our society on our doorstep that they have to come and they're taking our resources away and making our societies unsafe. Unfortunately, this is the world that we live in. I am Africa, and I have this terrible cold, and you are Europe, and you say it's none of my business. As soon as I sneeze, someone in Europe is going to catch my cold. When we talk about the world being a global village, so what is our role? What responsibilities do we have as a people? What should we do? It is important now for all of us, more than ever before, to get involved. Whether it's at the level of your religious institution, whether it's at the level of your community, whether it's at the level of, of your offices, it's time for us to get involved. And then the question you may ask me is how do we get involved? The first thing I will say is that knowledge, again, is power. Most times, we act the way we act. We treat people the way we treat people because we have no clue on who these individuals are. Amongst us in Italy, and I'll claim an Italian citizenship just for the next one hour, and then I'll give it back to you all when I'm leaving from here because I'm proudly Liberian. But do I have the consensus of the room that I can be Italian for one hour? Mm? So if I can be in Italian for one hour, trust me, I will give you back your citizenship because being Liberian is in my blood. It's not in the passport that I carry. But say I'm from this country and I'm part of this society. You have a wave of people coming in different skin colors, different looks. My brother sitting here, I can say, definitely you're from South Sudan. True? Senegal, oh my God, he's from West Africa. You can pass for a South Sudanese. 
I'm sure we have someone from Nigeria or Ghana or somewhere in this room. But you have all of us from different places and different spaces. One of the ways that we need to breach some of the divides that we face in this world is by beginning to recognize our collective humanity. As different as I may look, what commonalities do we share? That collective, that thing that would make you reach out to me regardless of my skin color is what we need to begin to exploit. A few years ago, I moved to New York to start working in the Columbia school system. And one of the things that I saw on one of the days I was going to a meeting, I've told this story repeatedly, three black boys, and I'm very late for my meeting, walking from one end to the other, and I saw these three black boys go into a nail salon. As a mother, I immediately stopped. Why did I stop? I don't know, but it's the nosiness of being West African and being a mother. They went into the nail salon and came out with a pair of slippers. As they were walking, they were going left, I'm going right, I followed them. This is none of my business, but it's the African in me. I followed those three boys, and I think God wanted me to see what I saw. There was a white man walking, and he was trying, old, very old man. He was trying to move from one point to the other, but the flip-flops he was wearing was broken. These three boys, black, saw it, were touched by their common humanity. They went bought him a pair of flip-flops, and offered it to him. The way I saw it was that as these boys walked by, they did not see a white man. They saw a human, a human with struggles. And they said to themselves, we see your humanity, and we see your need for help, and we're going to grant that to you. So the first thing we need to do is begin to tear down the walls that we built around our hearts and around our souls and around our spirits that make us to see black and white when we see individuals or that make us to see immigrant when you see someone dressed like me because it may not necessarily be so. The more we stop to ask questions and to take off time the more in our own small way we're bringing our world closer to peace. The second thing that you need to do is to begin to take actions on global issues. Oh, how many of us spend one hour a day on Facebook? Let me see by show of hand. One hour on Facebook. Two hours. Three persistently checking. We have all of these gadgets at our disposal. How can we begin to now start telling stories for peace? How can we begin now to use our voices and our intellect to try to bridge the divide around peace? We need peace today in our world more than ever before. When I talk about wars and the need for all of us to fight to end some of these wars, let's think, let's think very critically about recently when we had the Ebola crisis. It was Liberia. But I remember leaving Liberia and coming to Rome for a meeting before the airplane landed at the airport in Rome. There were ambulances, there were police, and they had my husband and I deem, and these people had on all of the gadgets, and they said, you just came from Liberia, and we want to take you into the hospital to test you before you go to your meeting. 
I was like, oh my God. I was in Liberia weeks ago, but by virtue of the fact that I had a Liberian passport, people were frightened, everyone panicked. I'm making this point to say that no one is immune now from everything that is happening around the world. A few years ago, I found myself in the Italian parliament raising my voice on behalf of the people of Libya and the importance of the Italian government not just spending their money on taking out Gaddafi, but the importance of spending their money to reconcile and rebuild Libya. And that kind of reconciliation should be true individual reconciliation. They gave some money to an Italian organization that I sit on their board. We went back to Libya. We spent a few days in Libya. And it was immediately after Gaddafi had been taken out. As we walk around that city, I was opportune to sit with about 100 young people. The one question I asked them was, where do you see yourself in five years? The room turned quiet and everyone started laughing. And one of the boys said in a very angry tone, I don't even see myself in the next 30 minutes. Madam, the vast of us that you see in this room are doing our utmost best not to join any kind of insurgency or insurgent group. Four years down the road or five years down the road, I don't think that situation is the same anymore. Today, Libya is a place with multiple armed groups. Different young people have gotten engaged and it's one of the most unsafe places to live. But the catch 22 is that Libya is also that place that most migrants are using now to make their journey to Europe. So if you think that everything that happens in this world doesn't touch me and I have no reason to be involved, you need to think twice. I spend my time now going from place to place advocating for peace and advocating for justice. Not because I'm the smartest there is in the world, but because I know that it is necessary if we all do our tiny bit to bring our world closer to peace. We all have to decide that we'll use our voices to speak up against things. So the young people in this room, you know, because you all spend so much time on social media, you always want to be trending. Um, this morning, one topic was trending. 20 minutes later, something else was trending, right? So yesterday, what was trending was um, North Korea has sentenced Donald Trump to death. But then, today, I'm sure there's something else trending. The point that I'm trying to make is, if you always want to be on the right side of the status quo, you never make history. Consider those who, over the period of their lives, are known to be great men and women, from Martin Luther King to Mahatma Gandhi to all of these people. These were individuals who decided, I'd rather be on the wrong side of history or rather be on the wrong side of the people that I live with than to be on the wrong side of history. So it's time for young people to begin to use their voices to speak out against these things. Several years ago in my own country, Liberia, through the clip of the film, Pray the Devil Back to Hell You Saw, we decided to take on a giant. And that giant was Charles Taylor. The war was raging. Women were being raped left and right. Children were being recruited into warring factions. We had no clue. When we sat down to do that work, we had only 10 United States dollars, and it came from someone's handbag. We wrote a statement. And when we wrote this statement, someone said, who will we say wrote this statement? Someone said the women of Liberia. We said, no. We have to name ourselves. 
naming ourselves on that statement became the first brave thing that we did. Because by the next day, everyone wanted to know who these women were who had gone out there to name themselves. Our actions went from barricading the hall so that warlords could not come out to confronting Taylor, the president, with our truth. At the end of the day, we were able, along with other actors, to end Liberia's 14-year civil war. It wasn't an easy fit. There were days that I used to wake up as the leader of that group and tell myself, this will be your last day in life. But we persevered. Because I kept telling myself, even as we did that activism, that even if I don't live to tell this story, I want the legacy to be that I tried. And my children should remember me as the woman who tried. Where are you today in a world that is upside down? Where are you today in a world where racism has taken over? Where are you today in a world where the divisions and the, 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 the political rhetoric is nothing but divisive? Where are you today in a world where even the way we prayed or the way we pray on a daily basis is now being used as a tool for violence? Where are you today when just because someone's sexual orientation is different or the way they dress is different, people treat them badly? Where do you stand? Do you want to stand in that part of history that is comfortable, you fall for everything and you stand up for nothing? Or do you want to be that person who people will see coming and say, this person is crazy, but I respect them. A few years ago, I found myself in DR Congo, sitting with a group of international actors. And they were all telling me the stories that I thought they wanted me to hear. And by the time they got through talking, I told them, OK, thank you for that part. But now I want to hear the truth. And then the truth of the matter started to come out. When we left the meeting, a friend from Cameroon came over to me and said, Lema, you know who you've become in this world? I said, no. He said, you've become like the mad woman in the village who speak the truth to people of authority and they don't dare question you. I said, well, if you find my speaking the truth to authority as a mad woman in the village that no one, I want to remain mad. I want to remain telling the truth to people because if this is the way we're going to fix our world, I want to be remembered as that person. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we do not have a lot of time. Young people, we do not have a lot of time. Old people, your retirement may be threatened. Academic people, we definitely do not have a lot of time. The time that we have now is a time for us to raise our voices put an end to everything that destroys or is not in line with our common humanity. I'll close with a story. Growing up, my grandmother was our primary caregiver. Until this day, I see a lot of things that she did in our life as that thing that prepared me for where I find myself. There used to be an old lady in our community where everyone said she was a witch and they would not engage with. One day, we decided to repeat this story to our grandmother as a matter of fact. She told my sister and I, you will follow me. We went to this space. We met this old lady. She kept taking us back and forth every day to see this old lady. We got to know her for who she was. She wasn't defined when we got to know her by the gossip of the community. She was rather defined by the way she interacted with us. Get to know someone who's from somewhere where you hold a negative stereotype. Get to know, read about a conflict and see how you can use your voice. Read about a global challenge. Read about an issue. Get involved in some form of advocacy in your community, in your home in your country. 
Our world is depending on all of you. Eleanor Roosevelt, the former first lady of America, once said, do one thing every day that surprises you or that frightens you or scares you. I have taken that quote and have turned it around because it is appropriate for the times that we live. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I leave you with these words. Do one good thing every day that everyone else is scared to do. Thank you. Invito uh, i miei colleghi ad a, a prendere posto qui vicino a me. Ho qui con me Sara Pennicino, Pier Giorgio Sonato e Maria Cristina Lavagnolo che um, introdurrò fra un momento. Uh, vorrei intanto ringraziare tantissimo Lee McPowe per questo discorso appassionato che ha interpellato tutti, io credo, ehm, dicendoci esattamente dove stiamo e che cosa dovremmo fare. Ehm, questa forza credo che venga dal, dal lavoro sul campo, non può venire certamente dal suo cuore grande, ma da un lavoro in cui ehm, si è confrontata con eh, le urgenze vere eh, del mondo. Quindi grazie tantissimo per questo eh, discorso ispirato. Eh, noi ora qui eh, vorremmo eh, fare una piccola tavola rotonda e poi apriremo anche a domande dal pubblico. Eh, non abbiamo molto tempo, però eh, ecco, eh, ci prendiamo il tempo per un commento, eventualmente una domanda. Eh, visto che siamo qui. Eh, comincio da Sara Pennicino che è professoressa associata di diritto pubblico comparato presso lo SPIGI dell'Università di Padova e anche adjunct professor of international human rights alla Johns Hopkins Europe. Pier Giorgio Sonato invece che è qui vicino a me è professore di elettrotecnica, dipartimento di ingegneria industriale referente per la cooperazione internazionale e delegato da cinque anni per coordinare un progetto di capacity building per una scuola di ingegneria in Etiopia nell'ambito di un accordo bilaterale tra Padova e un Ateneo etiope con l'intento appunto di eh, realizzare dei titoli congiunti. Maria Cristina Lavagnolo è docente di ingegneria sanitaria e ambientale all'Università di Padova, ha diretto il Master internazionale in Integrated Management of Water Resources and Environmental Sanitation in African Countries dal 2012-16 che era un progetto finanziato dall'Unione Europea e ha cofondato, e questa è una cosa bellissima, il progetto culturale A Literary Café in Yaoundé, Cameroon, per promuovere la consapevolezza su questioni ambientali che sono anch'esse strettamente collegate uh, alla pace globale. Ecco, quindi siamo in buona compagnia, vorrei magari cominciare dalla più giovane, <ride> se non ti dispiace, eh, con un brevissimo intervento. Grazie. Beh, innanzitutto grazie mille, è stato un discorso che ha ispirato tutti, credo, quindi grazie davvero. Il, il mio commento inizia con una battuta, se questo è il villaggio globale c'è da dire che ovunque le donne lavano i piatti, quindi qualsiasi sia la prospettiva dalla quale si percepisce questa metafora c'è un elemento di universalità che rende la categoria femminile trasversale rispetto a qualsiasi conflitto, a qualsiasi eh, situazione di difficoltà economica, politica o di qualsivoglia altro tipo. E faccio questa premessa perché c'è un ricordo che lei condi ha condiviso nella, nel suo libro, ma credo che lo abbia fatto anche in altre occasioni, 
rispetto alla promessa che le fece la sua mamma quando eh, lei decise di, eh, doveva decidere come riprendere a studiare, riprendere la sua vita e sua mamma le ha detto io mi legherò la vita se non sbaglio, che è la promessa di fare qualsiasi cosa pur di aiutarla. Allora io mi domando quello che fa lei come, in termini di advocacy è legarsi la vita per i suoi figli a un livello personale e per tutti quanti gli altri, perché questo è un sentimento materno, femminile, di una universalità potentissima. E allora l'invito è leghiamoci tutti un po' la vita, anche gli uomini secondo me possono relazionarsi, legarsi la vita forse è il messaggio. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, you know, when I started my work, when I started my work, I had these very young children, four at the time. Now they've expanded to eight. And I do not have any recollection of my kids losing their tooth and coming to me because I was always gone in my fight for peace. But one of the first group of people that I encountered in my work were young children who had been conscripted into the Liberian war. And not just were they young ex-fighters, each of them had some kind of physical disability. And I got particularly close to three. One was about seven when he started fighting, another was 10 and another was 12. One lost, two lost arms and one lost a leg. And Every time I used to see them, they would either cry or do stuff, but that's how I spend my time. For the last 20 years, let me give you an example of my life. I've never slept in my own bed for 30 days. In the last 20 years, there is never a time that I've slept in my bed for 30 days. And if I spend two weeks at home, it's like I've spent a year. So I was never around for these children. And most times people will ask me, do you regret? And I say, no. Is it that I'm a bad mother? The answer is no. Is that I have expanded my motherly nest to not just eight children, Today, I've expanded it to this university that if any young person can draw inspiration from my life and decide to step out there to do it, then I have succeeded. So yes, you're right. I took my mother's advice because she sacrificed for me. But today, I'm sacrificing for peace and for the rest of the world. This is my response to that, but thank you for that. Darei la parola a Pier Giorgio Senato. Intanto mi associo anch'io al ringraziamento per l'intervento che, che ci ha proposto qua a tutti, in particolare eh, ai giovani per la visione che ha, ha dato diciamo, el... e io vorrei collegare davanti a tutti questi giovani e da, avendo letto anche una, qualcosa della sua biografia in questi giorni eh, legandolo un po' a dove siamo qui dentro cioè in un ambiente accademico in un'università ed essendo coinvolto in un progetto di eh, Appunto, come è stato detto, di capacity building, cioè di cooperare per costruire 
una università eh, in un paese africano, è quello di eh, qual è il ruolo del higher education in una regione nella quale noi, eh, come dire, l'interazione tra l'Africa e il mondo diciamo, europeo o il mondo avanzato, eh, qual è stato diciamo, nel passato e qual è invece oggi il vero reale bisogno e il contributo che questo può dare per una costruzione di una società equa, sostenibile e in pace. Faccio un esempio di un'esperienza proprio di eh, recente eh, che andando a, a realizzare una scuola internazionale visitando un'università lì in Etiopia mi hanno fatto vedere un laboratorio per di, dedicato al futuro sviluppo di energia nucleare. In due università mi hanno chiesto di andare a fare corsi in ingegneria nucleare perché il mio background è di quel tipo. E, e la mia risposta è stata cosa ve ne fate voi dell'energia nucleare nell'Africa subsahariana? Cioè stiamo, quando avete delle potenzialità energetiche, siccome poi appunto il mio background è di energia, eh, quando avete un poten una potenzialità enorme dal punto di vista idroelettrico, solare e in certe regioni dal punto di vista del vento, cosa ve ne fate dell'energia nucleare? Quando potete sfruttare qualcosa in maniera diffusa su distanze enormi che possono cambiare la qualità della vita ed aiutare lo sviluppo del paese, cosa ve ne fate di un'energia di quel tipo? E allora eh, io volevo collegare questo alla responsabilità che reciproca che abbiamo, università, accademie europee e accademie in Africa, per sviluppare progetti di, di, eh, ed, di higher education che siano e che abbiano questa visione che lei ci ha dato della, di uno sviluppo pacifico, equo e solidale per quella popolazione senza invece forzare e violentare a un trasferimento di modelli che sono invece i modelli con i quali eh, noi, eh, i cliché con i quali noi eh, siamo abituati a pensare. È un costruire insieme qualcosa che eh, ci costringe tutti a eh, cambiare il modo di, eh, di guardare o, e di vedere quella che è la vera realtà. Ecco, volevo sapere un po' anche il suo... Questa, cosa ne pensa poi di questo? Well, uh, um, I, I without a doubt believe that education is key for Africa's development. But I have my criticism. The first thing I would say is that, and it, this is my personal view, which is often very radical, and I make no apologies for them. Um, in Africa, we have an educational system that needs intense overhaul. We, we need to redo our entire educational system, including the curriculum. Most of our countries teach history that is of no relevance to the modern day. So, for example, in my country, no child is taught history of the Civil War, which is the immediate past, something that is important for them to know in order to plan their future. The history that the young people are taught are the history of colonialism is past. I think the more we continue to teach on how Portugal conquered Africa, or how America came, or how England came, we are still reinforcing that colonial mindset of these people still being the leaders of our continent. The second area that I think we need to think about when we talk education, and this is not the forum for me, but since you raised it, I will raise that, is how do we link theory with skills? We teach a lot of reading things, and you realize that a lot of our young people finish high school and they are useless. Because if you finish high school and you do not have money to go to university, 
You haven't even learned a single skill in high school that can take you through life. So we need to consider overhauling or including technical skills to academic skills. When it comes to our universities, there is definitely, we're giving too many degrees for jobs that are not available. Today in Africa, we're seeing the oil and gas industry come up. We're seeing solar energy, like you rightly said, as a huge thing. We're seeing buildings coming up, road construction, um, the construction of, of, of railways, but not a single university in most parts of our continent are teaching young people these things. So that's the kind of overhauling of our educational system that we need to do. I come back to your point of one school asking you to lecture on nuclear energy, and it brings home the point of the human security concern. A vast majority of our countries, and this is not just Africa, including this country, military budget surpasses our education, health, and basic social services budget. For a country like Liberia, why do we need a budget for military that is almost 50% of the overall budget? If you give your people quality lifestyle, good health care, food, their basic needs are met, you don't have any threat of war. The threat is within now, it's not without. So I think it's important for us, those of us in academia, because I'm sure when you go to Ethiopia or some other place, there's a lot of respect for you as the professor coming from Italy. And I think it's time for us to stop being politically correct. That's exactly what I was talking about. And start telling people the truth. And the truth is that you do not need nuclear energy thing because no one is going to come and attack you. Your threat of being attacked is from the young people that are being poorly educated. So for me, education is everything, but there are certain facets of education that needs to be worked on, on our continent and in other parts of the world. Grazie. Ciascuno, ciascuno di queste domande, risposte, commenti aprirebbero eh, dibattiti. Eh, io mi trattengo e do la parola a Maria Cristina Lavagnolo. Grazie. Allora intanto grazie anche da parte mia di essere qui. Allora io vorrei raccontare una cosa che un pochino riassuma quello che abbiamo anche già discusso, che è un po' il ruolo della donna in questa società che vogliamo costruire per la pace e anche l'aspetto dell'educazione. Eh, quando mia figlia aveva 11 anni eh, ha ehm, aderito a un progetto, che è un progetto internazionale, eh, di un'associazione che si chiama CISV, Children International Summer Village. Eh, lo scopo di questa associazione era riunire in una parte del mondo, che è ogni volta diversa, centinaia di bambini eh, che arrivano da tutte le parti del mondo. E questo è un progetto che è stato fondato dopo la seconda guerra mondiale e appunto voleva insegnare, educare i bambini a stare insieme nelle diverse culture perché in questo modo si può costruire un mondo migliore, un mondo di pace perché se ci si conosce fin dall'inizio, da, da quando si è piccoli, i bambini non vedono le differenze così come le vediamo noi, e anzi le differenze diventano un modo per eh, avvalorare no, chi si è e l'altro. E in, quel, in quella occasione mia figlia doveva scegliere un progetto che parlava di pace, e ha scelto la Liberia, la via per la pace, era il 2004. E in quel momento noi abbiamo sentito parlare per la prima volta di Lei Magowe. E la cosa che ci aveva stupito era proprio come attraverso la nostra femminilità noi riusciamo ad ottenere dei grandissimi risultati. E la peculiarità della femminilità è la generosità, eh, l'empatia, la capacità di andare oltre le situazioni difficili e forse perché ci arriva il fatto che siamo madri e quindi abbiamo anche eh, mentalmente una psicologia più forte. E, mh, io devo dire che ehm, 
da ingegnere andando in giro per il mondo eh, e guardando quello che succede eh, mi sono accorta che così come esistono le fake news esiste anche il fake progress e che noi molto spesso eh, nascondiamo la nostra volontà di voler costruire case, costruire ponti, in realtà nascondiamo veramente tutt'altro. E da ingegnere ambientale, qui anche da donna, devo dire, allargando un attimino la visuale, eh, devo dire che l'ambiente spesso viene utilizzato a questi fini, che sono i fini appunto non corretti, e mi sono accorta anche che molto spesso l'inquinamento che viene perpetrato attraverso eh, anche atti di, a volte no, che sembrano grandiosi di ingegneria, in realtà progetti grandiosi di ingegneria, in realtà non sono altro che la nuova arma di controllo per le nuove generazioni. E quindi quello che io mh, appunto vorrei sottolineare è che chiedo alla nostra ospite anche in che modo noi come madri, anche come professioniste, possiamo, qual è lo strumento educativo più forte che noi possiamo avere? Mettere in contatto le persone, insegnargli effettivamente il rispetto della collettività, il rispetto delle cose, ma qual è, e non è solo l'educazione a livello universitario, è un'educazione che deve andare in parallelo su tutti gli altri livelli ed è appunto il motivo del nostro caffè letterario Yonde, eccetera. Quindi, ma qual è lo strumento che noi possiamo utilizzare per andare in trasversale su tutti i livelli? Grazie. I think most times in the world that we live in today, people tend to want change and we're always looking somewhere else for change. Um, I believe that the tool that we can teach everyone starts with us how you treat people. That is the education that, you know, anyone can get from anyone. I have a small house apartment in New York. And in June, you probably see 10 or 11 people living there because all of my children's friends from college, they come, so we've named the apartment the West African Hotel, because we have air mattresses, the dining room turned to a bedroom, the living room is a bedroom. People are sitting all, we can't fit on a dining table when it's time to eat, so we're all on the floor in the kitchen. But over time, as we've done this, I've come to realize that all of these young children, most of whom have never met their parents, leave that house with one thing in mind, that regardless of where we come from, we are one people, and that they have to go out into the world to show. There are certain values that each and every one of us hold dear to us that we will fight for. For me, I will fight for any woman's right. I will fight for the value of truth. I will fight for peace. I will fight for my integrity. And the way I want to teach that to my children is to allow them see me stand up for those things that I fight for. I have an eight-year-old, and I took her to the park, and she and her friends were playing, and there was these little boys passing around with the water gun. So they would spray the girls, and the girls would start to cry. So I called the boys and said to them, they don't want to be sprayed. You need to stop it. And they went around and came, and one of the little boys, white, turned that gun on me and sprayed me. Very wrong move. First thing first, I screamed, and then I went full force pigeon English. And the parents were sitting there. And I told him, the next time you feel like spraying anyone, go and spray your father and your mother. Do not, but I, I, I was so mad. But when I got through talking and talking to the parents, they took him out. Going, taking the girls 
one of my daughter's friends turned to her mother and said, you would not have done that. You were going to be too polite to do that. And Mrs. Bowie is not polite in speaking up for herself. But that time, I used that moment to tell these little eight-year-old girls that you will meet these kind of people along your way, and it may not necessarily be boys. The point that I'm trying to make is not to try to make myself look good, but to say that even in the little things that we do, within our homes, outside of our homes, is the education that we're teaching our children. I tell my sons that when they're getting married, I'm giving their wives a present. And the women will not be allowed to open that present until the day one of them turned crazy enough to hit them. I told them, I will tell your wife, keep this. If he ever hits you, call me because I will want the two of us to unwrap that present together. So in Africa, they have the cane. I'm going to wrap cane into gift papers and give it to my daughter-in-laws. And if they call me and say, it's time to unwrap, trust me, you will read it in the papers because we will hoop that boy, but he will never beat his wife. But the point is, we cannot do global advocacy if we don't start from within, in our circles, in your office. How are you speaking the truth? Let me put my foot somewhere that will make everyone regret why they invited me here. I know in academia, it's very difficult for women to, 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 to navigate. Half of what men make, you don't make. A lot of the recognition in the tenure position pass over women and go mostly to men. So you have to fight tooth and nail to get your issues on the table. Do you sit back and not say anything and then tell all the young women in your class, oh, you have to fight for your rights when you are not fighting for your rights? So that is the education that we have to give because if they don't see us fighting, if they don't see us standing up for what we believe in, I don't care what kind of camp for activism or human rights we send our daughters to, there will still be some kind of inadequacy. So stand, standing up for yourself, I will not, and I can tell it to anyone, I will not hesitate to fight for what I believe in, regardless of who I have to fight. You have two options. Don't invite me or invite me back. That's the two options, but we need to teach these young people it's time to stand up for the values that we believe in. And I know you believe in the values of truth. You believe in the values of human rights. You believe in the values of justice. Stand up for it. Quickly, we went to North Korea. I think I'm the only person in this country who has spent five days in North Korea. So in 2015, 30 of us activists went to North Korea. They had this convoy taking us around from place to place. One of the days as we were driving through the streets of Pyongyang, the bus knocked down a woman. I have never seen that in my life. The guards on our bus jumped out of the bus, picked that woman like a ragged doll, and put her on the sidewalk and told the driver, let's go. We said, no, we will not go. Everyone started panicking. Said, no, 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 you don't question. We said, no, we will question. I know my friend Abby Disney and some other women were vocal. They said, no, this bus will not move until this woman is taken to the hospital. And people stopped to look because we were like to the driver, you can't go. Air was like, maybe something. No. Eventually, they brought a car put this woman in, and took her to the hospital. And then every day we had a man with us who said, we need for you to update us. So the point is, whether he was telling us the truth or he was telling us a lie, we left one legacy in that place, that there will be people who will challenge you around issues of human rights. And I think that's what we want to teach our children. 
especially the girls in the world that we live in today, that you have to, if you don't speak for yourself, someone will speak for you and they may misrepresent you. You will come back. Um, credo che sia il momento di aprire uh, alle domande dal pubblico. Um, se c'è qualcuno che fa girare un microfono, per favore. E, e se ci sono delle domande o dei commenti, ora è il momento. Ok. When I read your story, I realized that faith gave you the strength you needed during your struggle. I'm going to ask you a personal question. When men uh, did not understand the reasons of women's rights, when you felt the danger of violence, when you were afraid of losing your own life, how was faith important to you? Thank you so much. Um, when we started that work, I, yes, I had gone to church, I prayed, uh, I, I say I knew God, but there's something about solidarity. The women around me, though they were not as educated as I was, but these were people who had bigger faith and who believed in the work that we were doing. There were days that I would definitely feel like I couldn't go on. These women were really like surround me not just, with, not just with words of encouragement, but with prayers. I remember the day we went to meet President Taylor. It was a stressful day. Because we didn't know if we were going to leave that place alive. And we didn't know if we were going to leave that place or we were going to be imprisoned. We got there and we, we sat down all 2,500 of us, but we held hands. And everyone is squeezing like from that end of the room to through this end, trying to give energy to the other person. I went up to read the statement and the women said to me, we prayed that you will have that kind of boldness. But after we left, we knew that we, I had to be careful. I went home to the most amazing scene. Older women in my community had come to my house and they were sitting on the front porch and they decided they were going to sleep there that night as my security guards. So how do you be fearful? You know, so it got to a point where it wasn't about me. I think I was living in 2003 an out-of-body experience. Because when you have so many people that you're working to protect, at the same time, you have a cause that is important to the future of your young people, you, you become fearless. So there were moments that I felt that way, but those women, their prayers... Days I would wake up in the morning and I would see them in my living room. They had come in early hours and they would just be sitting there and praying for me. So over time, I've really come to the place where my faith is extremely important to me. You know, I tell people that I am nothing without my faith. And I'm not ashamed to say that my faith is important to me. I, I'm a Christian 
But I also say that I'm a citizen of the world and that my religion is peace and love. So yes, while I profess Christ as my savior, I am not one of those people who will say, I don't want Muslim here, or I don't want Hindus here, I don't want Buddhists here. I can sit in the mosque, I can sit in the temple, I can sit anywhere because I think if you go into all of the religious teaching, the one thing that is constant is loving your neighbor as you love yourself. In every teaching, that is one thing that is constant. So if you go into the Islamic teaching, you will see it there. If you go into the Hindu teaching, if you go into Buddhist teaching, everywhere it talks about loving the other. And the question I, I, I most times I say, and this is moving away, if we are, by all of our teachings, taught to love each other, why don't we? Why do we focus more on the things that divide us when it comes to faith than the things that unite us? Recently, in my own country, Liberia, just a short information, some members of parliament went and decided that they should redo our constitution and declare Liberia a Christian nation. So, of course, I'm one of the local voices that people want to hear from. And they asked me, what do you think? Because everyone knows you to be a Christian. I say, well, if people have to change the constitution for us to be a Christian nation, then we have a problem in this 21st century. Christianity or faith is not about rating. It's about interaction. Do we have 80% Christians in our parliament? Yes. Do we have one of the most corrupt parliaments in the world? Yes. Let your act of Christianity be shown. Oh my God, it was headline news. Some people say, I will soon get excommunicated from my church. I say, well, if they excommunicate me, I will start my own church. But faith is very important to me. Sono altri commenti, interventi, domande? Sì, qui, uh, grazie. Yes, uh, I wanted to ask you, do you think that men can understand our struggles and join our, our fight? because there are, you know, a lot of people, even women, that don't join us fight for feminist rights. Why? There, there are so much, so many men and women too that don't understand our problems. Well, you know, I think packaging. You know how you, if I'm selling this um, earphone, and I package it very well, and someone else is selling the same thing, and they package it poorly, and we put, it's the same quality, it's the same make, we put it down, who do you think, they will, which one you think they will pick up first? The one that has been packaged well, right? When we start our conversation about gender equality, and having men as our allies, how do we package? If we always persistently package the conversation as, oh, these men, they are so bad. All of the troubles in the world is attributed to men. Do you think we will buy them over anytime soon? No. You have walked into this room where there are probably 20 men and you're trying to buy them on your side. And you just came in and bashed them. They will not come on your side. You've just packaged your whole concept of gender equality and male allies in a very poor way. And then I walk into this room and turn to a professor here. And say, sir, 
What is your take on gender equality? Oh, well, Lima, you know, I think, yes, women have the right to do what they want to do, but I think, you know, it's too radical and this and that and the other. And then I turn and say, Professor, do you have a daughter? And he said, yes, I do. Do you love her? Of course. She's the apple of my eye. Professor, would you want your daughter to have a doctorate degree? Of course. As a matter of fact, I want her to follow in my first step. So, Professor, when she's a doctorate holder and she's a professor, would you want her to make less than the younger men working in her department? And Professor would say what? No. That's discrimination. But then, Professor, that's what we've been fighting for. Grazie, è illuminante pensare alle stesse cose ma con un'esperienza e un linguaggio diverso. Credo che eh, stiamo imparando tantissimo anche per le nostre azioni e le nostre politiche, per le pari opportunità in questo Ateneo. Ho visto delle mani alzarsi, c'era qualcuno là dietro mi pareva? Sì? No. Eh, possiamo portare il microfono? Grazie. Uh, I wanted to ask, how can we reach to that peace and how to make women listen to, to this speech while there are women, our, some mothers, uh, women who are convinced to be one step lower than men or who are not like capable to see that they are strong and they can make these changes but they just believe that no we have to stay one step lower so here if we want to make this piece wide and to be to expand this uh, idea, don't we have to teach these women how to move, how to think, how to start to, how to change and teach their children how to react in the out, with the outer world, with every day, the things that happen every day. If some, a mother says to, her child, no, you can't have this opportunity. You have to give it to your brother. Why? Because he's a man. He has to be, have that greater opportunity. So here, the problem isn't spreading the peace. So we have to maybe go back to the source and make the change there in order to, to reach to our goal. Because if one person is so convinced about something and another is moving forward, ha making progress, while the other is not having this capacity, the ability to, to go forward, then here, how, how can we do this progress where we can all walk together one step at a time together? I have a quick question for you. Where are you from? I'm, uh, my father is Lebanese, my mother is African. Which country for, in Africa? Guinea. 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 Guinea? Guinea. Si. Guinea. Have you ever been to the village in Guinea? Not much. So unfortunately, I would say that's why you hold that mindset. The mindset, and I'll stand up because I have to engage you. The mindset that they, 
need to be taught. Your grandmother was socialized to be the lioness. And if you know about the lion species, you know that the lioness is the most what? Powerful. Your grandfather was socialized to be the lion. When the lion go and get the kill, what does he do? If you follow the history of the animals, the lion brings it home, the lioness and the cub have their fill, and when they're exhausted, then the lion goes to eat. The history of the Guinea people is the history of West Africans. Are there other West Africans in the room? You from Nigeria? Ghana? In our culture, the women may not be the educated ones, but they are the powerful ones. You're from Senegal. They were socialized to stay at home. And the boys, before formal education came, the women would manage the home and manage stuff, and the boys would go to school. I mean, they would go in the field with their fathers. When formal education came in the form of colonialism, what it brought with it was this, the disempowerment of the African woman. And you can challenge it in any reading. I'm in the university here. In most of the places these people came from, the women were stay home, stay home, stay home. The boys were the ones going to school. The power dynamics shifted when colonialism went to Africa in that the men were supposed to be seen as powerful and the women were supposed to be seen as weak. There are two categories of people, if you read some anthropologists in Africa, the ones who maintain the cultural values. And if you walk into their homes today, the women are still powerful. And the ones who have the parochial socialization, they did not take the African way and they did not take the European way. So they're stuck in the middle. Those are the ones that reinforce. I'm Pele. And we have Pele people in Guinea. In all of my life, I never saw my father beat my mother. Because it was not a part of his cultural upbringing. My father was more educated than my mother. He died poor. My mother owned everything that they worked for. My grandmother is 109. She stopped in fifth grade. At 109, she still collects money from her properties, even though she doesn't have the formal education. So let me stop there, and let me take you back to those uneducated women that you think we need to go and teach. I had that same mindset. So we go to a village to work, and we're talking peace, and the men are sitting and talking, and the women are standing on the fringes. So I stand next to the female chief, and I say, you need to go and have, let your voice be heard. And she said, don't worry. They would talk and talk and talk and talk. They would never find an end to the matter. They would say, let's go and do what? Sleep on it. Right? The African people in the room say when they go to sleep on it, and even for the Arab people, then they confer with their wives. And these wise women gave them the solution, and the next morning they step out and put forth the women's solution, and it seemed as if they're educated. That's the other part. 
The final part that I will guide every young professional in this room who wants to do development work, whether you are white, you are black, you are piper, or you are green, do not approach your work from that mindset. You will fail miserably. When you go into a community, no matter how awkward it looks, no matter how unsophisticated these women look, go with the mindset of I came to learn. I met a group of students from Harvard who said they were going to one country for three years. They've been going to change the women because there were domestic violence in their community. So for three years, they had gone there, and for three years, they had not solved any problems. So they came to ask me. So I asked them a quick question. Did those women tell you that domestic violence was their problem? They said no. So how? Say, so, well, when we go, we see that they are treated badly. Are you kidding me? You fly from the U.S. into a space, and you decide that this is the people's problem? Don't do that, baby. They will excommunicate you from your village if you go back with that mindset. There are issues. But for us to address those issues, we must go with a learning head and a learning heart. That's my advice, not just to her, but to all of you who think that you've come to Italy and you've gotten sophisticated education, so you want to go back to your villages to educate people. You could miss the mark. If you went with a learning head and an open heart, you can do more good than you ever imagine. Am I clear? I think this uh, long applause from the floor is actually the right comment uh, with which we close uh, this encounter with Lee McBowie. Um, we are all very, very grateful uh, for your generous engagement with us and for your messages. I do think that the world is a better place because you're in it. Thank you so, so much. Thank you all.